another new day. Another brand new -y. Lots to do with my day today. <laughs> uh, what am I going to do today? Quick note. Um, if you came here yesterday, you met Chippy. So I've been running through how to do this. How to make this video without having to be too much of a production, right? Like I was saying, we would have had to go to the coast, to go to where you normally take the Zodiac and get them in some shots, some real bears, but that's a bit of a bit much to uh, try to throw down, especially because it's going to be overcast and possibly raining there. So still sunny here. So here's my plan. I have that fully mounted monster grizzly bear right there. Pretty easy to move it around. So I'm going to uh, set that sucker up in the front 40 here where I dropped a bunch of trees and film it from a distance behind Chippy's head. Well, he's glassing to make it look like he's, he's glassing this uh, live grizzly bear. But first I need to get him to, uh, I'm going to set up a camp, a little tent out back in the forest, make a little fire, have his little snacks, put him uh, in his little thermal rest on the ground in a sleeping bag, camping out. And then he's got his little uh, iPad. And uh, I've got, I have some monster grizzly bears on trail cameras. I already have those clips. I'm going to put those on his, I'm going to have him doing his own trail camera on a tree branch, opening it up. And then on his iPad, checking out the actual grizzly bears I have on the SD cards in video. And then we'll go to him glassing the grizzly bear and then uh, sighting in his rifle and then popping the bear. And then I'll just put the bear on its side with the legs going away from the camera and have him walking up and going, yes! <laughs> and then I have this uh, grizzly hide already tanned. And then I'll use that in the end in his camp <laughs> with him in his... And his uh, grizzly rug. It's going to be absolutely hilarious. So, there you go. Now, what's going on in the world today? Um, I have to be back in here for noon. At noon, we have a, a meeting and a video with Mr. Richard Hucklebridge. He sent me an email, I caught this morning, and decided I'd share it. He said, Hello, Steve. I just hope this internet Wi Fi is going to hold up because I'm a little worried about it. If it's going to do its job or not. I'm sure it'll be fine. I have a lot to say about these Sabe beings that a lot of folks may not appreciate. But I'm going, to, I'm going to give you what I got anyway. Mainly because the people must know just what in the world they are dealing with when they encounter these beings out in those wild places. I'm never too busy for you and the, for you and the people to where I want them to know what I know and possibly even learn from it because if they enter our forest, they should know about what they might have to deal with. Looking forward to our meeting. There you go. You can't get my attention more than that. All over it. That's going down this afternoon. What else? What else, what else, what else? Did anybody hit my, hit the community page yesterday? And I just said, please just listen to this one video for the first 15 minutes is all you gotta do. It, the, the message in there and the facts are just absolutely outrageous. In the state of Pennsylvania, the war on food and the, the track record of the farmer they're persecuting, the track record of the farmer and his products is 100% perfect in the favor of being healthy and edible. And they are absolutely trying to annihilate him and his existence. And they're jailing people illegally that work for him on his farm. The list goes on. I can't repeat it all because I'll start having smoke coming out of my ears. But that's an example of... It's just an easy example of what's really truly going on today. And that uh, you need to do something about it. You meaning us, meaning we need to do something about it. Man, sometimes I look at the forest, it just looks like something's there looking at me, but whatever. Yeah, the war on food. There is there's no doubt about the war on us. It's just it's it's a little crazy. But anyway, I noticed that one thing the messages the messages daily fed to the people through the government owned mainstream is so nasty. It's just nasty. I don't ever see I don't ever see public messages being passed along of, as an example, make sure you do what you love to do today. Said nobody ever on mainstream news, ever, right? 
Nobody ever said that. Nobody, nobody promotes you to, uh, to be happy. Nobody ever promotes, promotes happy. Ever. I went through the headlines this morning. It was like, um, uh, New Caledonia, French troops messing up the mopping up from the protesters. Obviously because there's French government there. There's another, the next title was seal killer. The next title was drownings. The next title was, um, three dead in a brawl in Montreal. The next title was tornado warnings. The next title was doom, doom, doom. And, and I don't ever look at titles. I don't ever watch the news ever. But when you do glance and you realize there is never a message of make sure you're happier and shit this weekend. Make sure you do something you love to do today, no matter what. Make sure you be happy. <laughs> make sure you support your neighbor. Make sure you go do something kind in your community. Said no news outlet ever. Mind boggling. Anyway, I'm not passing on doom and gloom. I am going to say it again. Make sure you do what you love to do. Even if it's for 10 minutes. And like I said, if you don't, that's that's what a loser is in this life that we've been given, right? You've been given time of life and you don't do what you love to do with it, you have absolutely lost. Because somebody is using your back to enable them to do what they love to do all the time. Right? Think about it. What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? I think that's about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We got to get some voices heard because I got a lot of shit I got to do. I got to go and kill a grizzly bear with a three-year-old. <laughs> I have to. Uh, we have to get one of our senior knowledgeable members of the Human Being Club on here to share exactly what he knows because he wants to help all the people and he's going to be honest about it, whether or not it upsets people or not. Love it. Now, what shall we hear from? The late, great Bobby Short, to start off, I think. I love hearing from Bobby. She's here with us, 110%. If she wasn't, I wouldn't have this in my hands. Right? Where should we go? Hold on a second. Okay, here's a chunk that may be interesting to some. We'll see. This is titled, The Year Rock Indian Doubles. Why you are okay. Back in 2009, Dave Plattis introduced me to the writings of author Lucy Thompson. In 1991, she published her book, quote, To the American Indian, Reminiscences of a Yurok Woman. It was an inspirational read that touched on the kidnapping of a woman by Indian doubles. Lucy Thompson was a pure, full-blooded, Northern California Klamath River Indian woman. Who wore the tattoos on her chin, deemed customary for the women of her esteemed high birth. I thought her chapter on abduction gave us a unique insider's view of that culture. There was this noteworthy excerpt from Thompson's book, quote, In the old times, the women especially were always careful to keep together on their camping trips when they were gathering the acorn crop, grass, seeds, and pine nuts for fear of these Indian devils. The Indian devils would sometimes watch the camps of the Indians very closely and follow them about as they moved from place to place, watching for an opportunity to seize one of the young women and carry her off to make her his wife. If a young woman strayed too far by herself, she was often made a captive by one of these devils. The women of the tribe had a great fear of them as they held great horror of becoming the wife of a wild man. Sometimes the women would be captured by the Indian devils and would be gone away from their tribe for years. And they, then, then they would return and tell of their wild life and experiences. They would become the mother of children. And the children would inherit the wild habits of their father as they would always be whistling, making strange noises, romping wildly about, and always on the go, roaming everywhere in the wilds. These women never were never happy when they came back to their devil husbands and children. When the Indians would go on their hunting and camping trips into the mountains, as soon as they heard an owl screech or a hoot, they would stop, listen, try to distinguish if it was an Indian devil imitating the owl or the cry of a wild animal. The Indians would stop at once, kindle a fire, 
This was given as a warning to the devils that they were awake and ready to fight them if necessary. When the Indians go camping far back into the mountains, and even if a white man accompanies them, they always insist on making the first campfire. When camp when a camping place is selected, they always insist on making the first campfire. When a camping place is selected, in building the fire, the first stick of wood they lay down points directly north and south. On the north end of the stick of wood, they place another stick some 8 or 12 inches back from the north end, placing this branch east and west, thus making a cross. Interesting. When the cross is made, they proceed to kindle the fire, and during the whole time, they offer up a prayer to God in a low tone of voice. This prayer is earnestly offered up to the Almighty, asking Him to protect them from the Indian devils and wild animals while they're in the wilds and to keep them safe from accidents. That's interesting, isn't it? Never heard of that before. That's in Lucy Thompson's book, To the American Indian Reminiscence of a York Woman, 1991. I'm imagining that book's probably pretty interesting. This is next chapter is the Wenatchee and Chuanito. Juanito? Chua, no, Chuanito. C H O A N I T O. The early Wenatchee Indians knew a hairy giant they referred to as the Chuanito. It's translated to mean night people or night person. Isabel, a hundred year old Indian woman, member of the Wenatchee tribe, gave the following report of an event which occurred during her great-grandfather's generation. Wow, so that's a hundred-year-old woman talking about her great-grandfather's generation. That's a while ago. In the fall of the year October, a group of male members of the Wenatchee tribe were on a hunting trip near Wenatchee Lake. One of the men became separated from the rest of the party and was captured by the Choanito. Choanito. He was taken to a cave far up in the Rocky Mountains and held captive by a family of Choanitos through the winter until spring. The odor in the cave was terrible. They would not take him out hunting with them, but made him remain in camp near the cave with the women. They were like a different tribe of Indians. In the spring, they returned, they returned him to where they had captured him. Upon returning to his camp, he was immediately recognized by the children who couldn't believe that he was back as he had been gone for so long. They thought that he had been killed. He had been well treated by the Choinito. Mm. Ed Fouche, quoted by. That's crazy. According to the writings of C.P. Leons in the Milestones of the Mighty Fraser, the following instances are only two of the many, many abduction stories by hairy giants told by the First Nation Canadians and handed down through time via their oral history. An Indian woman living near Laidlaw, British Columbia, related this story in all seriousness. Quote, Over 100 years ago, roughly 1850, when the Indians were berry picking, one woman who had stayed from the others was suddenly confronted by a giant. Too paralyzed with fear to scream or run, she was quickly carried up the steep mountainside. After a long climb, during which time she remained in a semi-coma, and so did not note the direction or length of time, she was carried through a rough door and into a rock cave. Two other Indian women were crouched in this cave, and when left alone with the new arrival, they told her, they had been captured in a similar manner years ago. They had been brought as wives for the giants and had since that time bore them children. The men would disappear for months at a time and then return with food. For the new women, they brought flour and smoked fish and they knew that they knew she was accustomed to eating. Holy crap, that's creepier than shit, isn't it? The fact they mentioned the use of flour dates the story as taking place after the arrival of the Hudson's Bay traders in 1827-1840. Although the women had been captive for over a year and had borne a child, 
she was determined to escape. The other two women told her they would help, and when the hairy giants left on one of their seasonal hunting trips, she was told to prepare all the food she could. She made bread bannock, or bannock, suggesting these people, or the Indian women at least, used fire, and with a heavy pack of food, set it across the mountains. After almost unendurable hardships, she became exhausted and was carried and helped along by the other two women, who possessed the giant's strength in some measure. She was left in a stupor near where she had originally disappeared. The villagers saw her, but suddenly became afraid of them and fled. She was pursued and carried to her father's house, where she fainted and remained under a spell. The Indians believed that the giants held some mental power over her, but with careful nursing she eventually recovered. Or they had knowledge of unknown herb with medicinal properties. The second episode is still fresh in many of the Indians' memories. Several years ago, in the, in the vicinity of Laidlaw, a hairy giant entered a house and caused a woman and her two children to flee in terror. That sounds like the Judy Chapman. Later, footprints approximately 20 inches long were found clearly imprinted in the mud along the route the woman had taken. Although she was not captured, she has since refused to live in the house. No doubt. Excuse me. Hair caught in the door jam was reported reddish in color. A 40-gallon barrel of salted fish had been picked up and dumped over, and the retreating footprints showed the Sasquatch had merely stepped over the railroad fences and returned directly to the steep mountain slopes. That was the Chapman story, 100%. And that was by cited by C.P. Leon's, quote, The Hairy Giants of Laidlaw, Milestones on the Mighty Fraser, 1950. Wow. All right. Well, okay, this one more. The Toloa, T-O-L-O-W-A, and the Quiet People. The Toloa Indians at one time inhabited the far northwestern parts of Northern California, just below what is now the Oregon border in Del Norte County. The Toloa Reservation ranged along the Smith River in what is now Humboldt and Del Norte counties. In 1996, Dennis Chase told a story about a Klamath Indian who told him his grandmother was able to communicate with the quiet ones. They were invited to attend the jump dance, brought baskets of acorns in exchange for other goods, especially chicken eggs, late 1800s. Anne and Red Cody recently met and interviewed a woman named Catherine, who is of Toloa Indian heritage. Her mother was Toloa, her father an Irish immigrant logger. Immigrant logger. She is now 72 and recalls many legends about Bigfoot, though in no particular order. The following are her recollections about the stories she heard growing up on the reservation in Northern California. I remember my grandfather telling stories of large hair-covered man creature. As a young boy, he was hunting and felt like he was not alone. He sat still near a bush and waited to see who might be following him. Not 30 feet away was a tall, muscular, hair-covered creature standing behind a tree. He watched it for a few minutes until it turned and walked away up the hill. He told his father about this, and his father said they were, quote, the quiet people, end quote, who shared the bounty of the forests and rivers with the Indians. Many had been seen, but it was considered evil to kill one, as they had never harmed the Indians. In the evenings, hold on a minute. In the evenings, they could be heard screaming in the woods, communicating with each other. My brother Joe, 10 years my junior, saw what appeared to be a Sasquatch mother with a youngster in tow. The infant was playing with a stick near the creek while the mother stood stock still and watched. When she noticed my brother across the creek, she grabbed her young one by the shoulder, pulled him in front of her, and she herded him into the trees. She looked back a few times to see if Joe was following. He was amazed at how quiet and stealthy they were. The mother was dark and uniform in color. 
while the young one was more mottled, with lighter hair on the torso and shoulders. Her grandfather told this story. She put the year in the 1880s. In the morning, our parents gathered all the family to clean and fillet salmon from the catch. She would prepare the fish <clears throat> excuse me, for smoking. We left the entrails for the animals and the birds to eat. After day at work, we packed up the fillets and started on the walk back to the fire area. Another morning frog. <clears throat> Excuse me. I felt my knife. I left my knife on the bank and returned to fetch it. And as I approached the cleaning area, I saw the big hairy man squatting down and eating the fish entrails. When he saw me, he stood and roared, perhaps to scare me. He did not want to share his meal. I ran back, told my mother, and she said I should never venture out alone. We returned in an hour, but the huge pile of entrails was gone. There was more entrails left there than a bunch of raccoons or other scavengers could, could have taken that. Sorry. Sorry. We returned in an hour, but the huge pile of entrails was gone. There was more entrails left there than a bunch of raccoons or other scavengers could have taken that fast. Another story from the grandfather. We would see the quiet ones once in a while, mostly in the evenings, just after the sun went down, sometimes in the very early morning. They knew we were there, but would not harm us. They would go out in the darkness, so they would not have to be seen by people. They would sometimes come near the fire at night, but stay just out of the light of the fire. Your nose would tell you that they were near, as they smelled like rotten meat. And then the next little mini title, Fighter. My father once saw two big creatures standing on opposite sides of a small clearing, yelling and throwing sticks at each other. He thinks they were fighting for the space or perhaps for food. He saw them many times, but was never afraid. They would sometimes take his food at night, but they would never hurt people. And then, curious about a baby. When my brother was a baby, our mother left him in a hammock when she went for water. When she came back, a creature was very near the baby, smelling him, but it did not touch him. It knew it was a harmless baby, but was just curious. That freak out, freak out your average parent. It frightened our mother, but the creature went up the hill when she approached. I was amazed to read the Tolowa stories, in particular the bit about yelling and throwing sticks at one another. That was behavior unknown to me at the time. Research has very few accounts where many have been observed quarreling and fighting amongst themselves. This one seemingly cited behavior that spoke to the issue of competition between two Sasquatches. Another reported skirmish occurred in Nighthawk, Okanagan County, Washington State. After lengthy communication with the informant, I wrote it up this way. George Brusaw claimed his grandfather, Elliot, told him about an encounter with two Sasquatch due west of Nighthawk off what is now Log Camp Road, or he believed, near there. This was during the World War II. The year was 1944. Oblivious to the border between Canada and the United States, the hare giants would come down across the border from Canada in late summer. The Broussaw story occurred at a time when his grandfather, Elliot, was on leave from the South Pacific hunting with some old buddies for fresh meat, which he told me was rationed by the United States government during wartime, along with sugar, coffee, gasoline, and tires. The hunters hoped for a deer, but would settle for a rabbit or a couple of wood hens, whichever came first. Coming out of a densely wooded thicket, they happened on a terrible ruckus. The men saw two big, hairy male giants, each with their hands clasped together tightly, using them as weapons on one another. They swung their arms and clasped hands with full force, knocking the other down until both were on the ground, trying to get back up to their feet. The grandfather illustrated for the young and impressive Bruce saw how they were making groaning sounds. It wasn't screaming, just sounds of intense effort being launched at the other with each swing of their great arms. His grandfather stood up going through the motions, showing him the intention, intentional force of the double arm swings. The creatures took at one another. The groans he demonstrated sounded like the efforts overheard in a hotly contested tennis match. 
It was very loud, and not a sound you would want to hear every day. The subject of the disagreement appeared to be a dead deer, where at one point the bigger Sasquatch, approximately seven feet tall, picked up the carcass and swung the deer, the dead deer, full force into the side of the face of the other hairy creature, who was a short of six and a half feet tall, felling him to the ground. He didn't move. He lay there quite still, his chest heaving. His opponent stared down at him through the settling dust, as if waiting for the fallen one to get up. Then as the downed hairy one tried to get back to his feet, the winner took the deer and headed off into the trees on the other side of the clearing. The dust settled and the other one got to his feet and trailed after the other one. It was all over in a matter of minutes. <laughs> Holy shit. So there you go. All your research is out there. You better start packing a dead deer around. All you gotta do is club him in the side of the head with it. You got him. That's it. Who'd have guessed? All these years. Bruce saw his grandfather said there were other stories from the area, but none so violent or terrifying to watch as this one. According to Bruce Saw, his grandfather remembered hearing about those big men that would come down from Canada and dive for bass around Palmer Lake, especially when the bass were spawning. The story is probably as close to a Bigfoot street fight as I've ever heard. <laughs> no shit, said every one of us. There you go. Thank you, Bobby. What do you think of that? You know, one thing, we're looking back at a couple of stories when, you know, they say when the women would stay together, never go alone. Well, I don't get that. I seriously just don't get that part. But there's all sorts of different, there's just different flavors out there, isn't there? I don't think we're referring to the same being. We just can't be. There's no way. Uh -uh. Some of these beings just sound like Regular, shy, reclusive, intelligent people. Well, meanwhile, then we got this other shit going on. Spitting in the back of a neck of a hunter in a tree stand 14 feet up, but you're not there behind him. Tracks disappearing, vanishing in front of your eyes, glowing eyes, sending mind speak to one another, right? None of that's mentioned in these old West Coast native... Uh, experiences passed down. I'm not calling it folklore. I'm not calling it frickin' legends. They're passing on what went down in their backyards to the next generations. But the part I don't understand is, is how can... Okay, I'm 10 feet tall. I could probably pick up a six pack of human beings and run with them. Why would I be hesitant with only with four women in front of me in the berry patch as opposed to just one woman standing under the berry patch? Why would I be hesitant? Big deal. Go and pick the one you want, pick her up, and off you go. Who gives a shit? What are they going to do to me? Do you know what I mean? There's too many, so many instances. We've always heard since growing up, never go alone. Don't go in the bush alone. Well, why not? Who gives a shit? That's what I've always thought. If something's going to kill me. It's going to kill both of us. <laughs> That's my always been my mindset. Why would I bring somebody else then with me? You know, because I go by myself all the time, right? I don't understand that part. Another thing when people always say they felt they were being herded to be in an ambush. Does, does not make sense to me. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't add up for me, to, 10 foot tall being, having to herd a simple, defenseless, dumb as a pickle human being, well, I need that human being to walk this way into this little fork here so I can really get him. Said no Sasquatch ever. Right? You're just gonna walk right out there and grab you and leave. It's very odd, some of these mentions to me. That's all I'm saying. Doesn't add up. It adds up if it's a certain type of being that only has so many skills, or maybe what's going on is, is four sets of human eyeballs too much for them for some reason that we don't know. Could that be it? They can get around the one set of human eyeballs, but is four sets too much? Is two sets of two different sets of human eye contact too much? That's the only thing I can almost maybe come up with. I don't know. Don't know. I'm gonna find out. I wanna find out. I'm gonna find out. What's this one? This is titled Attacked by a Bigfoot. 
coincidental theme. <clears throat> Excuse me, looks like it's been sent a couple times. Hi, Steve. My name is Mac Milner. Mac, I hope you said it. Oh, you're free to use my name. Thank God. <laughs> I've been investigating reports on UFOs and Bigfoot casually over the past nearly 60 years. Holy! Since I saw a UFO in 1964. About the same time, I heard my dad and brother discuss a Bigfoot incident reported in a magazine. But the past seven years, I've studied these subjects practically daily. Here's my story. Wow. About 11 years ago, in the summer of 2012, my wife and I went to Niagara Falls for a week of vacation. After staying in hotels for a week, we spent the last night in a bread in a bed and breakfast on the New York side in a very old home. There were maybe 10 other guests that spent the night there as well. The home was dark and spooky, perfect for a haunted house movie, but nothing happened. The next morning, we all ate breakfast together in a large dining room and chatted casually. Someone mentioned the spooky house and that she was nervous it may have been haunted. This is my first opportunity to explain that ghosts are not spirits of departed people, but in truth are demons pretending to be the spirits of departed people. The conversation somehow moved to Bigfoot, and I explained that this, too, was a spiritual being, not a flesh-and-blood animal living in the forest. It is actually some kind of a de demonic creature, I then told him the story of a demon possession incident that occurred in Manila in the 1950s. The most documented demon possession story ever recorded. To look it up and read about it yourself or your listeners, the account can be found by googling Lester Sumrall, S-U-M-R-A-L-L, who was the evangelist that went to the jail where a 15-year-old girl was incarcerated and experienced attacks that resulted in bites on her shoulders and upper arms, some of which were two inches deep. The girl was the only one who could see the demon who was biting her. To everyone else, it was invisible. After a few weeks, Lester Sumrall was able to cast it out. The girl described it in such a way that it sounded similar to how a Bigfoot is described, except, of course, this one had fangs. That is freaking terrifying. I, I am absolutely not into that shit at all. You know, like the movie The Exorcist, any of that crap comes up, I'm out. I'm, not, I'm out. I don't like it myself. I just don't want nothing to do with that world. Are we possibly dabbling in that world doing all this shit? Maybe. Maybe. But I heard about that story before reading it here. And that is creepier than shit. But another thing too is... Who passed down the skills on how to cast the demon out? Right? Who did that? How'd they learn? Right? Why aren't we taught that in school? I went on to explain that the Bigfoot creature is also a demonic being, and that the Bible is true, and Jesus is real, and the only way a human being can have eternal life. That was the important thing, that faith in Jesus Christ and his personal sacrifice on the cross is the only way for us to be forgiven of our sins. I want them to know that this is God's means of forgiving us of our sins and giving us internal, eternal life when we die. Everyone was very interested in the story, and shortly thereafter, we all left the, bread and, the bed and breakfast, or you, you call it a bread and breakfast. Okay, well, up here, it's called a bed and breakfast. Whatever. <laughs> minor detail. We all left the bread and breakfast to go our separate ways. My wife and I went on a went for a hike on the Niagara River. It was a long hike down into the chasm to the river below. We were well past the falls, there in a steep embankment with the forest all around us. We made our way all the way down the maybe two mile hike to the river, lingered a while and then returned back up the trail. As we climbed the trail, I was feeling relaxed and lazy amid the beautiful surroundings and the weather. It was getting to be late in the afternoon, but still plenty of sunlight. My wife got ahead of me and disappeared over a slight rise in the path as I lingered in a spot where I saw an unusually pretty flower. When I looked up, she was gone. So I determined to start a slow jog to catch up. Very close ahead was a tree on my left with roots that crossed the path 
they were exposed due to erosion. I took a mental note of them to be sure I wouldn't trip over them. And as I approached that spot in the trail, jogging very slowly, my left foot was suddenly violently struck from behind and underneath. Read this. Read this one. Not far enough into it now, right? Thrusting it wildly forward with incredible force. It struck an exposed root and instantly I felt pain in my left big toe. At the same time, something broad and flat hit me on my right shoulder blade, throwing me violently to my left. And with my left foot stuck on the exposed root, I fell to my left. Or should I say I was thrown to my left. Down I went onto the rough path. I extended my hands to break my fall, but that did no good. I smashed my chest into the large, sorry, I smashed my chest into the path hard. I felt a good amount of pain, but I instantly looked over my right shoulder to see who or what hit me. There was no one there. The forest was not thick at all, and I could see a good distance up the hillside as well as the path behind me. Whatever it was that attacked me was invisible. My sternum hurt for three months before it recovered from the impact. My left big toe was fractured, and the bottom of my foot turned purple from internal bleeding. My hands were bruised and had small pebbles on the path from the path embedded in them because of the force of the fall. Something big and strong and angry had thrown me down. I'm certain I was attacked as an act of revenge by a Bigfoot demonic being for revealing the true identity of these beings to the people at breakfast that morning. Debatable. I've heard other reports of Bigfoot sightings where people saw them suddenly materialize or disappear right before their eyes. That's because of the spiritual nature of these things. They are genetic constructs that have their origins, origins, sorry, origins, <laughs> origins in the times of the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 in the Bible. I believe they are extremely hostile and dangerous. The accounts in which they appear friendly are incidences where they want to deceive people. They are largely unable to harm us because God limits what they can do. But I believe in certain circumstances they can. I want to close my story by saying that I'll be careful to use the name of Jesus to drive these things away, just like any other demon the next time I'm hiking in the forest. I hope you'll share this, Steve, and that you'll invite Jesus to be your God and Savior. Once you know him, you too can use his name to command demons to flee from you. Who knows, it could save you injury and harm someday when you're out there by yourself. Keep up the good work. God bless you and your family. Mac Milner. There you go, Mac. Appreciate the email, man. Is it true? Who knows? Who attacked you? What hit you? I don't know. We don't know. He didn't see it. There's a lot of confusing things going on. When I get, when I have stuff opened up and shared with me, I just, I always look at everything from different angles, right? You know, there, we, non-stop keep hearing that they are limited in what they can do. You know, they're not allowed to touch us, they're not allowed to harm us, it's the rules, etc., etc. But then we just finish hearing a whole pile of First Nation knowledge passed down of women being stolen, basically raped, right? Okay, so they're not allowed to harm us in any way. They can watch us, but they can't do anything. Oh, well, the odd time they can steal somebody from your family and take her in the mountains and rape the shit out of her. Doesn't add up. It doesn't add up to me. You know what I mean? I don't know. A little confusing. But, uh, but, but I need to hear it all. I need to hear from Mac Milner. I need to hear from the First Nations people of today and, and generations gone by. I want to hear every little tidbit. I don't give a shit if it's repeated 15 million times. I want to hear it. Especially if it's being repeated. I really want to hear it. If it keeps getting repeated from around the globe... I want to hear it. I want to take note of that repeat. And I want to hear the similarities. Right? It's funny when somebody blew a gasket the other day. <clears throat> Most of the code, I just caught it. 
I forget even where I just read it. It made me laugh instantly because this person blew a gasket and said, I've been watching this for three years. No, we got his stories. Where's the proof? <laughs> oh, boy. Can you imagine your brain still telling you that? Like, what makes some people's brains tick? I've been hearing stories for three years, but where's the proof? <laughs> How could you even type that publicly? Think about it. Holy shit. I've been hearing eyewitness testimony for three years straight, all different people, but where's the proof? Said no smoothly fu firing human brain ever, <laughs> right? Holy shit. Anyway, I better bite my lip. <laughs> if you're picking up what I just threw down, you know what I mean, and you're probably still giggling along with me, right? Holy shit. Why do I have, okay, here's a whole slew of unreads. <laughs> Which one? All right, let's go, here's one. I gotta get moving. This is titled, My Encounters with Sasquatch in Central West Texas. Steve, I've watched your posts on this channel for about a year now. I have a story to tell you about a series of encounters I experienced with others near the Guadalupe River Basin in the hill country of Central West Texas. It took place over a period of two years or so, and I opened up my location to a variety of researchers and enthusiasts, many of whom had a variety of experiences and collected audio, track casts, and other unique evidence of their own. This area of Texas has large tracts of private land full of whitetail and access deer, hogs, wild turkey, and a variety of other critters that aren't supposed to be there, such as Jagarundi and Koti Mundi. But also has but what it also has is rather large presence of Sasquatch, and they aren't particularly shy of human contact, as they're pretty much left alone on these large hunting leases private ranches and farms to do as they please. I've had rocks thrown at me, set up a feeding station, and spent a lot of time feeding cant cantaloupe, watermelon, and apples till they became aggressive. I've caught them raiding bird feeders, stealing and rearranging antlers on an outdoor display, recorded tracks at one trackway of various sizes, taken your typical blurry photos with an old cell phone that are still recognizable had hair I found in twisted cedar trees tested, and they had a primate scale pattern. My son was charged by one, and he actually told me his watch stopped working at the exact moment. I've heard howls, growls, moans, a lost call that sounds almost musical. I've heard them do a thrush-like thrumming, thrumming noise that sounds like a grouse taking off. And I've had Two Class A sightings, all over a period of two years. Maybe we could chat sometime. I've had a good serious... M I've had good serious men like M.K. Davis, Randy Harrington, Dave Clear, John Morley, and Lupe Mendoza come for visits to this location. I know M.K. Davis spoke to them on the phone, but none of the other names. Whatever. I've found rock stacks pelvic bones used for digging up tubers with fresh dirt on them, and the hearts of young yucca plants full of teeth marks that were consumed like we would eat an artichoke. There were two books, two books written about this location by one of my guests. It was a unique experience for a man who grew up in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, hunting and fishing his whole life, but never even thought about these subjects till I moved to Texas in 2012. Anyway, brother, I'm sending this because, unlike the bickering and often closed-minded Bigfoot community, who thoroughly soured me on this fascinating subject, you seem like a generally good man to search for real answers, hoping can communicate someday and swap some stories about these subjects. They're not here all the time. Even in places they're comfortable where resources for opportunistic carniv omnivores like them are more than abundant. Maybe we can chat online when we have a minute. Till then, keep catching fish, stacking your freezer with wild game, and 
most importantly, searching for answers with the open mind you brought to the subject matter. Sincerely, Michael Brookrison. Brook Brookrison. Okay, man. Well, let's do it. I'm all in. When did you send me this? This is recent, so you're here right now. All right. So I'm going to mark this as, <coughs> excuse me, email this dude. <laughs> that ought to get my attention. And I'll email you. We'll set her up. Sounds like you're, you know what, if anything, I almost want to at least give you some relief so you can talk to the people about the horseshit going on that you just mentioned about the, the so-called Bigfoot community. This should almost be called the Bigfoot cannibalistic community, right? That should be, maybe I'm going to do that. If I ever have to say that term in the future, I'm just going to naturally start saying the Bigfoot cannibalistic community, <laughs> right? Because all they do is absolutely annihilate each other non-stop. You know there's people that actually have channels. <laughs> YouTube channels absolutely only dedicated to attacking Bigfoot researchers. <laughs> I can't think of more of a waste of time of life. It's like, come on, really? There's so many more good things you'd be doing with your time that just want to attack people for yeah, by my lip. By my lip. There you go. Okay, I'll get a hold of you, man. If you want to spill it, you can spill it. Spill your shit. Bring your truth here. We'll share it. As long as it's legit, I'll know with my gut in a second. I will know with my gut. Now, gotta get moving. I have a big, huge grizzly bear to kill with a three-year-old. <laughs> and then, then, I can't wait to hear from Richard Hucklebridge. That's just in a couple hours. I gotta get my ass moving. I'm all ears. I am all ears. Especially when people come here. When people come here, when people that have had a lifetime of researching and they want to come here and share with all of you, that for me is a indicator that they're going to be legit. Because the uh, Bigfoot cannibalistic group, okay, what is it? What is it again? Community. The Bigfoot cannibalistic community. They hate this place. <laughs> they don't like me and they don't like this place. And they don't like the fact that all of you get equal or more attention than them. They can't stand it. <laughs> so all I'm saying is when you come across a few individuals that have a lifetime of gathering information on this topic and they are drawn here to share with all of you, that's a good sign. To me, that's a good sign. I'm all over it. So I'll get a hold of this man and then uh, let's carry on. This might be a short one today. I don't know. Um, share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you're going to get a share it word for word, all right? And I'll leave on this note. Make sure you do what you love to do no matter what and try to promote something happy and good. Whether, whether it be with your, your children, your family, your friends, your co-workers. Just try to start, try, just try to start going the exact opposite of what the dark wants you to do, Okay. Try to do a con make a conscious move of doing every single thing they want you to see, look at, say, repeat, or do. Do the opposite. It's going to first start off with doing what you love to do, being kind, promoting kind, and happy shit. Okay? Try to do that. It's like, it's like planting a little seed. Make it grow and rub this dark shit out. <laughs> okay? It's a very important thing to do. I'll be back. I'm babbling.